He was kidnapped. Baby was gone. But suddenly, 14 months later, he's found. Or is he? This is my life, and this is my only shot at solving these mysteries. Tonight, Barbara Walters with the 50-year-old cold case that 2020 has suddenly turned red hot. This couldn't be an easy case, could it, Barbara? A grown man's obsession with finding out if he's the real baby Paul. Hundreds of all new leads pouring into our 2020 tip line. Cousins being found, caregivers. The crib was over by the window. Stunning age progression images. If he's not the real Paul, is this man? It's ghostly to see it in person. And finally, the shocker that will change everything. Do you know who stole this baby? Yes, my mother. She had a room with nothing but wigs and nurse dresses. Tonight, is there finally an answer of who was really stolen at birth? Oh, oh. Here's Barbara Walters. Good evening. Tonight, a program literally 50 years in the making. As a man living a mystery comes the closest yet to finding out who he really is. For the last year, 2020 has been along for the ride with him, bringing in hundreds of leads ourselves as we asked for your help. But nothing could have prepared us and the FBI for the most shocking call of all the one that might finally solve the mystery of who was stolen at birth. I want to show you some photographs. Looking at old family photos with Paul Franzak is a strange experience because the baby in his baby pictures is not him. How do you feel when you see this picture? I feel like I want to find him and hug him and make sure he's okay. Paul has a wife, Michelle, a daughter, Emma, and a fish named Blue. Say hello, Blue. A perfectly ordinary life. The problem, as he recently discovered, it is not his life. This mystery, born of a terrible crime, was supposedly solved nearly 50 years ago. But today, it is a paradox. So strange, even his name is not his own. Who is Paul Franzak? That's what I hope we can find. The crazy, amazing story begins with a villain, an evil woman dressed in white, and a baby stolen at birth half a lifetime ago in 1964. Lyndon Johnson was in the White House, leading a nation still reeling from the assassination of President Kennedy. A young journalist named Barbara something or other was breaking into television, appearing on the Today Show and the original boy band was shaking up America. In Chicago, Chester and Dora Franzak, married two years, living in an apartment in his parents' home, were starting a family. A first pregnancy ended in stillbirth, but on Sunday, April 26, Dora gave birth to a healthy nine-pound boy. They named him Paul Joseph. He was a very cute, um, alive, sparkly baby, and she was thrilled. Mary Trenchard Petrie was a 19-year-old student nurse at Michael Reese Hospital in Chicago. She was in the maternity ward with Dora Franzak the day after her delivery. That whole thing is like a movie in my brain. I see myself in my uniform and as a student nurse, I see the joy that was when they brought the baby to her the first time, how thrilled she was. But soon the thrill and the baby would be gone. It was the last time Dora Franzak would hold her son. Earlier that day, a woman dressed like a nurse all in white had come into her room. She looked at baby Paul and left without a word. The woman had been seen elsewhere in the maternity ward several times that day and the day before. No one questioned her or raised any alarm. Former FBI agent and ABC consultant Brad Garrett has looked into this case for us. My sense is she was looking for what child she wanted to take. That afternoon, the woman in white returned to Dora Franzak's room. As I was leaving the room, a woman came into the room. This time, she did more than just look. And did Mrs. Franzak give her her baby? The woman said to her, um, the doctor wants to see your baby. And she said, oh, okay, and handed the baby to her. 
the fake nurse was able to whisk Paul Franzak out of the maternity ward, down several flights of stairs, and out of the hospital. Apparently, she got in a cab and took off. Easy. Easy. Very easy. Just like that, Paul Franzak, less than two days old, was stolen from his mother's arms and vanished. The baby was kidnapped. The baby was gone. Mary Trenchard says 45 minutes passed before the baby was missed. They said, do you have the Franzek baby? And I said, no. And she said, well, then the baby's gone. I was like, gone where, you know? And, and she said, you go back to Mrs. Franzek's room and stay with her. The baby's been taken. There was a frantic search. Nurses turned the hospital upside down. But astonishingly, for several hours, no one told Dora Franzak, the one person best able to describe the kidnapper, that her baby had been taken. Your heart must have been in your mouth. It was awful. Finally, authorities came empty-handed to the maternity ward to deliver their stunning news. And they told her, Mrs. Franzak, your baby's been taken. Is there anything you'd like to add, Mr. Franzak? What would you like to tell the person who took the baby? We uncovered rare archival news photographs and film footage of the case. Here is Chester Franzak, the day after learning that while he was at work as an aircraft machinist, handing out celebratory cigars, his boy had been stolen. Do you have an appeal to the kidnapper? I pray that she'll take care of the baby and return him. A distraught Dora Franzak with Chester kneeling by her side made a public appeal for the kidnapper to return their son. Do you, do you have any reason to think why she might have taken the baby? The only thing I can think of, she must have been desperate for a baby that she would come and take someone else's baby away from them where she couldn't have her own or she lost hers or something. But even losing the child, I don't think you're that desperate to go and take another woman's baby. If the kidnapper, seen in police sketches, heard the Franzak's plea, she was not moved by it. But others were. FBI agents and police, many working on their day off, searched the city for the phony nurse and the kidnapped baby. They threw out a dragnet, pursuing hundreds of leads and tips from the public. So where do you go from here, uh, Lieutenant? We're still checking out all the leads we have that we're receiving by telephone and other uh, checks that we are making. Authorities had another problem. If and when they found the baby, how would they positively identify him? There was no DNA testing, and blood testing was inexact. Particularly if you go back to 1964-65, extremely challenging trying to match up. Is this the child, uh, the biological child of the Fronsacks? There was another identification method then in vogue, the shape of an ear. Basically, it's the dimension, size, and the folds of the ear. Authorities were about to get a chance to put the ear theory to the test. 14 months after the kidnapping, a child was found, a boy, apparently the right age, halfway across the country. Was it possible? Might this be the face of Paul Franzak? And I heard the ladies say, oh my God, this is my child. This is my baby. Stay with us. Twenty twenty Stolen at Birth continues. Once again, Barbara Walters. It was the biggest kidnapping since the Lindbergh baby. Paul Franzak, stolen at birth by a fake nurse. His angelic face peering from the front page was the last anyone had seen of him. Left behind were an empty crib and two broken hearts. A year passed, and then one day their phone rang. 800 miles away in Newark, New Jersey, a boy had been found. The FBI contacted my parents and said, we think we found your, your son. Whoever abandoned the baby had dressed him up, wheeled him to a department store in a new stroller, and walked away. 48 years later, we return to that very place with Paul Franzak. Somebody wheels a stroller, puts you here, walks away. And never looks back. And never looks back. It's, it's crazy. 
New Jersey authorities temporarily placed the abandoned boy with an unidentified family. That period was a mystery until after we first aired the story. Then Janet and Gracia came forward. She contacted the 2020 tip line with incredible new details. She says it was her family who had cared for the boy as they had for nearly 100 other foundlings over the years. He was an adorable little boy, he really was. The FBI is now investigating the little abandoned boy. Yes, they came several times and they took different, like a mold of his ear and that was sent up to Chicago. Authorities compared the shape of the left ear of the boy in New Jersey with the baby photos of Paul Franzak. One day, Janet's family was summoned to a meeting. They were told to bring the boy. He was led to a room where Dora and Chester Franzak were waiting. And I heard the ladies say, oh my God, this is my child. This is my baby. And everybody, everybody's such an Oh my God, the woman found her baby, and this baby found his mother. The Franzaks took the little boy home with them to Chicago, and that was the last time Janet saw him. You have not seen Paul Franzak in something like 50 years. That's right. Would you like to meet him now? Oh, I certainly would. Oh my. Hello, Paul. Hi. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing oh, good. How are oh, you? Good. Um, this is, this is... <laughs> surreal yeah, right it is yeah. after so many years it completes my heart <laughs> this brings back such good memories <laughs> on a winter morning paul and janet returned to the house in watchung new jersey where he spent almost a year as a child paul remembers nothing of that time janet doesn't forget a thing your crib was the crib was over by the window, okay? You loved my father dearly. You really did, you know. You were the one that uh, used to sit on his lap, you know, and uh, he used to just fall asleep in his, on his lap, and then he'd take it and he'd put you inside, you know. <laughs> you were very happy here, Paul. You really were. There was great happiness in the Franzak home, too. The family, so often filmed in Heartbreak, now recorded home movies of their own. The star of every celebration, of course, was Paul. They had missed his first step, first word, first birthday. But Paul was now back where he belonged, blissfully unaware of his past until years later. When you were 10 years old, you had a shocking discovery. Tell me about it. I was looking for Christmas presents and snooping around the house, and I found all these boxes. And it turned out it was a box of clippings uh, and a bunch of cards and letters about a kidnapping. Did you ask your parents about it? I did. I, I asked them, you know, what is this? And they said, well, you were kidnapped. We found you. He like, just like that, you were kidnapped, we found you? And that's all that matters. You're our son, we love you. How did your parents explain what happened to you? They really didn't talk about it. It was something that we really didn't bring up in the house. It was a very touchy subject. Did you ever feel that there was anything out of the ordinary when you were growing up? Well, I, I did notice that I didn't resemble anybody in my family. You had a brother? Correct. Yeah. And he looked like your parents? Exactly like my dad, 100%. And you didn't at all? Not at all. When he grew up, Paul pursued a career as an actor. I told you we were nice. We're really nice. His resemblance to George Clooney got him work as a stand-in in Ocean's Eleven movies. Ready, steady, go! Today, Paul works for a college in Nevada, where he lives with his wife, Michelle, and their daughter, Emma. Good job. Again, Daddy! Do you remember how you felt when Paul said, I'm not really sure who I am? The first time he told me, I thought he was joking. I thought he was just kidding around, but then once I realized it was true and I saw the newspaper clippings, I felt... Um, very sad for his parents and sad for him. How do you think it has shaped him? I think as a 10-year-old boy, when he first saw those newspaper clippings, not realizing who he was, I'm sure that that has somehow shaped him and that's done something to him over the years. Um, it's just sad. Was it sort of there in the back of your mind, this peculiar thing? It was really a big part of me through my whole life. And it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Who am I? Who am I? Yeah. Then last year, Paul happened to see a DNA test kit for sale at a local drugstore. At last, an easy answer to the question that had followed him all his life. 
the hard part, asking his parents for a DNA sample, forcing them to travel back in time to the most painful part of their lives. It's something I wanted to do for a long time, but I never really had the nerve to, to ask my parents. Still ahead, will the Franzak family agree to end decades of doubt? Paul is determined to find the truth, but his parents seem just as determined to keep it hidden. When they said, Paul, please don't, please don't send it in. We don't want to know. Twenty Twenty returns with Barbara Walters. From his home in Las Vegas, a city defined by luck and loss, Paul Franzak took the biggest gamble of his life. After decades of wondering, of suspecting that he might not be the baby stolen from his mother's arms, he asked his parents for samples of their DNA. I think I got him off guard a little bit. because I, I, just, I mentioned my, to my mom, did you ever really wonder if I was really your child? And she said, yeah, we, we thought about it. I said, well, what if we can find out a way? And they said, well, yeah, we'd like to know. And then I went and cut the DNA kit, and it was all done in five minutes. But later, second thoughts. Were you ready to handle whatever secrets might come out? Yes. Were your parents ready to handle the secrets? No. They called me and they said, we don't want you to have that test done. And if you do it, we don't want to know. I had the packet ready to go on my desk in my house for about three weeks. And I would pass it every day, fighting with whether to do it or not. And finally one day I told my wife, I said, you know what, I have to do this. I really need to know. It was the answer that he had anticipated and feared. The results were in. The test that would tell him if he'd been living a lie. Describe the moment when you got the results of the DNA test. I got the phone call. I found out that there was no remote possibility that I was a Franzak child. And all of a sudden, I felt the color drain from my face. And I said, are you okay? And he said, I don't know. He said, I feel a little dizzy. I need to stay in my chair right now. And all of a sudden, I started thinking, I don't know anything about myself. I don't know how old I am, my heritage, my birthday, all these things that people take for granted. I, everything I thought was my life wasn't. He said, I don't know anything about myself. And I said, well, you do. You're, you're, you're my husband. You're Emma's dad. You know who you are. But who he is is not this baby boy. For Chester and Dora Franzak, the fairy tale ending to their family tragedy was revealed to be just that, a fiction. How does a loving son say to his parents, you are not my biological parents? That was another hurdle I had to go through. Um, my dad's 82, doesn't, he has a hard time hearing on the phone. And my mom, I, I knew she would be very upset. So I really thought the best way would be to send them a letter. Would you read it? Sure. All right, so it's Dear Mom and Dad. First, I am your son and always will be. I love you both and that will be forever. I am not the kidnapped baby that you had stolen from your arms on April 27th, 1964. This means that the real Paul Joseph Franzek may still be out there, alive, not knowing who he is. I know this is hard for you, but this is also about me at this point. What was the reaction of your parents? My dad called me, and he called me a name that he never has called me before in my life. How'd you feel? I was speechless. And then, and then my dad hung up. In their heart, I was their son, and that's all that mattered. Did you think maybe you shouldn't have taken the DNA test? I struggle with that quite a bit. It's, I mean, I love my parents, and I always do what they ask. But this is something that I really felt I had to do. But the truth hurts. The Franzak's prayers to find their stolen baby had actually never been answered. For Paul, fond memories have become bittersweet, tainted by the knowledge that he was not kidnapped and found. He had been abandoned, most likely by a parent. The toughest moment for me is when I watch the home movies of when I was first brought back from Jersey, and I see how a young boy was running around that someone had just left. And it, it just, it kills me every time I see that. I look at my daughter, she's four years old, and the thought of, of leaving her behind, I, that's what really hurts me the most. 
Paul is now determined to solve the two mysteries in his life. Who is he and what happened to his parents' stolen baby? My main goal is to find the real Paul. My parents raised me and they did a great job. And I feel that if I don't do everything I can to help find the real child, then I'm not doing my job as a son. Don't you also want to find out who you are? It'd be a great bonus. To help Paul solve these mysteries, we introduced him to Brian Ross, our chief investigative correspondent, and ABC News consultant Brad Garrett, a former FBI profiler. So we're starting to pull together, you know, anybody who touched the case in your game. I'm in this for the long haul. To crack open a cold case that is five decades old, Perhaps we hit the airwaves. Robinson, I'm in Chicago for the hunt for a stolen baby. Asking viewers to test their memories and send in tips. So if you know anything about this case, let us hear from you. Coming up, shocking new twists in the case from the tips you sent in. The resemblance is uncanny if I'm not this guy. If this is what the baby would look like today, is he the real Paul? Next on Stolen at Birth. Since 2020 appealed directly to you to help solve the mystery of Paul Franzak, we have been inundated with tips from you. But the two that you are about to see, which came after this investigation first aired, have astonished even the FBI. Here is ABC's Brian Ross, back at the scene of the crime. Until our 2020 investigation, the case had been as cold as a Chicago winter. But now, in the wake of our first report, the 2020 tip line has been alive with all kinds of new and admittedly sometimes wacky leads about the stolen baby or about Paul Franzak's birth family. Some viewers suggested he might be related to football quarterback Brett Favre. He's not. And good evening, everyone. I'm Todd Connor. Others wrote saying he bears a resemblance to the anchorman at our ABC TV station in Indianapolis. Another dead end. And there were at least three 50-year-old men who thought they were the stolen baby, based on drawings of what he might look like today. I could be Paul. I might be Paul Franzak. I do believe that there's a chance of me being Paul Franzak. But while none of those three were a match, we continued to get more tips, including two that got the full attention of the FBI. That hairline is so simple. First, a man who grew up in Chicago with a strong resemblance to the stolen baby. The resemblance is uncanny if I'm not this guy. And then a surprising admission from a man who believes the stolen baby had been in his home. So you're saying you saw this baby? That baby. In your house? It looks like him, yes. The new attention and the new leads grow out of the one and the only solid piece of evidence from 50 years ago. The hospital on the south side of Chicago where Paul Franzak was stolen long since shuttered. Its records nowhere to be found. And the key detectives from back then, all dead. Do you have any further uh, clues? Uh, no, sir, not at this time. She has... All that remains is the hospital photograph taken the morning the baby was stolen at a day and a half old. And that's what was used by the artist at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children to create the age progression images that we used to propel our investigation forward. I feel good about it. I think it is in the ballpark, yes, sir. The last known sighting of the baby and the kidnapper was at this intersection in the Chicago neighborhood of Bridgeport, where a cab driver told police he had dropped them off after picking them up at the hospital. 35th and Halstead is where the cab came from the hospital. The police went door to door looking for possible suspects. The search went on for days in 1964. Hundreds of officers and FBI agents were involved. And our consultant, former FBI agent Brad Garrett, says it is likely the kidnapper had some ties here given past infant abduction cases. They tend to be from the community where they take the child. So we did our own door-to-door -door canvas with the image from the Center for Exploited Children and another one produced by artists commissioned by ABC News from the Michigan firm Fojo.com. Some of the old timers in Bridgeport remembered the case. I do remember that baby being stolen. Yeah, there was handbills with uh, the picture of the woman. A drawing? Yeah. 
We don't recognize these. But no one recognized any likeness to the people living around here now. Then last month, Paul Franzek visited Barbara Walters on The View. So tell us what your quest is. The, the main quest is to find what happened to Paul because a tragic thing happened the to my mom. The real Paul Franzek, the real baby who was kidnapped. kidnapped. And a viewer thought she knew the solution to this five decades long mystery. A friend of hers in Dallas by the name of Sam Miller. There she sees this picture come up on TV and she called me, she goes, you're going to think I'm out of my mind, but you've got to go to this website and look at this. And so I did, and we all just stood there in shock. This is the picture? Yes. It's ghostly to see it in person that large. Yeah. Not only does Miller look a lot like one of the age progression images we had produced, but and look at the me. baby pictures. This is the photo taken of the baby just before he was stolen. Yeah. And as you know, your own baby photo from whenever that was taken. It looks like me and it looks like my son. Miller, a 49-year-old like Microsoft executive, those. is the right age to be the stolen baby. Grew up in a suburb outside of Chicago and did not learn he was adopted until earlier this year after doctors told him his kidney disease had taken a serious turn for the worse. He called a cousin for information about the family's medical history. I'm end stage renal disease and I need a kidney. She started the sentence with, what kidney disease? You mean you don't know you're adopted? So for Miller and his wife and two children, the prospect of finding his real family could be a matter of life and death. So here I am and hope that I'm able to find a kidney, find my family and go on with my life because I'm kind of near the end. Miller was eager to provide swabs with his DNA sample to be tested and made contact with the FBI. This must be quite an emotional uh, moment for you. I look like that guy and I have no idea where I came from. And then, as Miller was showing me pictures from the family album, Corinne Mosak, my mother, the phone Probably. rang in the kitchen. <laughs> it was the call from Chicago he had been waiting for. This is Sam. I would like to know who I am. All right. When we return on 2020. Wow. Stolen at Birth continues. Once again, Brian Ross. It was in this quiet, upscale neighborhood of Dallas, in this house on Colgate Avenue, that a life-changing drama was about to play out. What seemed like the strongest lead yet in finding the stolen baby. 49-year-old Sam Miller, adopted under what he called unusual circumstances, a mirror image of one of the age progression drawings of what the baby would look like today. And the baby photos of the two, hard to tell them apart. We were there when he got the phone call that would resolve it all. From the government office in Chicago that had his original adoption papers, which 2020 helped to get unsealed. I appreciate it, I, I would like to know who I am. It was a 90 second phone call full of nervous anticipation. I see. As Miller learned what was found in the adoption files okay. that had been kept secret until this moment. My birth mother was Sheila. If true, that meant that Miller had not been stolen, but given up for adoption legitimately. Not the stolen baby? No, they found my original birth certificate. For Sam and his family, hugs and tears and disappointment. You okay? Yeah, we'll be fine and a new search for a family he now needs to find as he faces a kidney transplant to keep him alive. I have a brand new search. Glad we got a quick yeah, answer. Thank huh? you so much for flying down. Well, of course, I, I appreciate no, it. really. For us, it was back to Chicago and the discovery on the 2020 tip line of what amazingly would turn out to be an even more intriguing lead about who the kidnapper might be. Do you know who stole this baby? Yes. Who stole the baby? My mother. Your mother stole the baby? Yes. His name is Johnny Harbo, and what he told us about his mother may seem far-fetched, but it most definitely is not. It's a pretty serious charge that your mother kidnapped a baby. Right. But she was arrested a few times for suspicion of kidnapping babies. His mother's name was Linda Taylor, a notorious figure in Chicago in the 1970s and 80s, dubbed America's welfare queen and vilified by President Ronald Reagan. 
Her name is Linda Taylor. The Leg Illinois Legislative Advisory Committee on Public Assistance investigated. Came up with 82 charges of welfare, fraud, perjury, and bigamy. Among other things, they discovered 100 aliases and 50 false addresses. We began to look for her after our 2020 tip line provided this clue. The baby was stolen by a lady known as the Welfare Queen. She had many, many schemes to get money and would have most likely sold the baby. Linda Taylor died 12 years ago, but we found her son living in a Chicago suburb, prepared, he said, to finally tell what he knows about his mother and the stolen baby. Did he have a name? He had a name, but we called him Tiger. Harbaugh said he was a teenager living in this house in Chicago when he came home to discover a new baby. Was your mother capable of stealing a baby? My mother was capable of anything. Not only stealing a baby, but she could steal you. She was just that kind of woman. You know, she done ever what it took for her to survive. Harbaugh said his mother was a master of disguise, could pass as white or black, Puerto Rican or Hawaiian, in her schemes to collect fraudulent welfare payments, sometimes posing as a doctor or a nurse. She had a room with nothing but wigs and nurse dresses and shoes. At the time that Paul Franzek was stolen from the Michael Reese Hospital, the police put out a, a sketch. Yes. Do you, do you think that's your mother? Except for the nose, but she could do anything with her face or her hair. In the 1970s, when Linda Taylor was put on trial for welfare fraud... Miss Taylor, can we talk to you for a moment? She actually came under investigation for stealing the Franzak baby. From one newspaper account, one of her ex-husbands told agents that Miss Taylor appeared one day in the mid-1960s with a newborn baby, although she had not been pregnant. It would not surprise me. Isaiah Gann was Linda Taylor's lawyer at the time and told 2020 she never admitted anything, but he wouldn't put it past her to snatch a baby. The woman was just a chameleon. She, she could be anything. So I couldn't rule out the possibility that she could be involved in something like that. Her son Johnny says he was already in trouble with the law then as a teenager and never volunteered what he says he knew about the Franzak baby until he talked with us and a reporter for the online news site, Slate. I wasn't going to go tell somebody, hey, I know where this baby is. You didn't do stuff like that back then. Harbaugh says he came home from school one day and the baby was gone, taken, he believes, by one of his mother's boyfriends to Tennessee. But you're sure about this? I'm positive. Harbaugh said the man who took the baby worked at what was then the American Rivet Company. A former employee there confirmed to 2020 the name Harbaugh gave us and said the man indeed had moved to a small town in Tennessee. Our 2020 investigative team went to Tennessee, to the town of Sevierville, but we could find no current record of the man who supposedly took the stolen baby here so many years ago. What would you say to the Franzak parents, Mr. and Mrs. Franzak, who had their baby taken away a day and a half old? Back then, I was young, a baby, you know, and I seen so many of them. I'm, I mean, there's nothing I could say to them. I mean, I couldn't apologize enough for not turning her in. Cold comfort for the Franzak parents so many years later. Until tonight, Chester and Dora Franzak had declined to comment on the new investigation. But this week, they sent their first public statement to 2020, saying, We wish Paul well in his search and we continue to cooperate with the FBI in our hope for answers. Next, all of a sudden this, this name pops up. For the first time, a family reunion 50 years in the making. This is really huge. When Stolen at Birth returns. Twenty twenty Stolen at Birth continues once again. Barbara Walters. For Paul Franzak, a mission has become an obsession. Can I go again? Between breakfast German. and if ballet we're lessons, finish, we're going to dance class. He is on the hunt. I work a full-time job, I have a family, but this, this is my life, and this is my only shot 
at solving these mysteries. So I put as much time as I, as I can. Everyone goes to bed at night, I'm, I'm online researching. This is my first actual baby picture right here. His focus is finding his parents' stolen baby, but he is still searching for clues to his own identity. I feel kind of like an imposter because I'm using his birth certificate. Paul is out there, and I have his birth certificate, and I want to give it to him, and then I want to find mine. Desperate to find any connection to his biological family, Paul sent DNA samples to three genealogy sites, 23andMe, Family Tree DNA, and Ancestry.com. We took the sample that you gave us, and we put it on a chip. And what that does is it gives us a unique DNA signature that only you have. So we compare your DNA to DNA from populations all over the world. So you kind of like CSI, but you work with DNA. It's, it's family history. The results were Paul's first indication of who he is and where he's from. There were surprises about his ethnic roots. You are 37%, according to our analyses, of European Jewish descent. Wow. Is that new? Well, I was raised a Roman Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, this is interesting. This so now I've been twice baptized, and I'm actually Jewish. So it's kind of cool. <laughs> I have to learn a whole new religion now. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited about that. Even more exciting, a major development in Ancestry.com's search. All of a sudden, this, this name pops up, and it says possible third cousin. Finally, a clue. And for Paul, a chance to meet his first blood relative. Her name, Fran Kirby. It is a moment 50 years in the making. I'm very excited. You get excited, you get nervous, you know, how's this person going to react to, to uh, me reaching out to them? Uh, what's the response going to be? Well, let's find out the response. We have brought here to meet you, your cousin, Fran. The first Hi. branch in Paul's family tree blossoming into the ordinary miracle of a family reunion. Hi. Hi, Hi Paul. Hi, nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet Paul, you. Cousin Paul, cousin Fran. Paul, a blood relative. How's that feel? It feels pretty good. <laughs> Did you know that Paul existed? No, I didn't. I, I Googled after I found out and saw your 2020. Paul, just to find out that there might be a relative is a very big deal for you, isn't it? It's a very big deal. This is really huge. This is one step closer. But then another step, make that a leap closer. Paul got another match on Ancestry.com, this time a possible second cousin. Finding a second cousin match is substantially better than finding a third cousin match. For C.C. Moore, a genetic genealogist helping Paul with his case, it was a eureka moment. I was extremely excited. I thought we might be able to have a very quick resolution to this case. That cousin's name, Alan Fish, a 57-year-old from New York. A second cousin could unlock the mystery. Alan and Paul's parents could be first cousins, their grandparents, siblings. But there is one ironic obstacle. Turns out Alan was himself adopted. So just like Paul, he was searching for his biological parents. To find that his closest match turns out to be adopted was just unbelievable, incredibly disappointing. This couldn't be an easy case, could it, Barbara? No, exactly. <laughs> a setback, and then a tragedy. Days before Alan would see court records revealing details about his birth mother, he died of a sudden blood clot. Alan's children and widow Randy are determined to carry on Alan's search and to help Paul with his. Hi. It's nice to meet you. We know this must be very difficult. Yes. In this very sensitive time, you still came in to meet Paul and help him on his journey. Yes. Why did you want to do this? All four kids at the same time.